just like after World War II, there was this incredible surge of technology that came out of almost like a resurgence of the Industrial Revolution worldwide. I think that that's going to happen after COVID from a, a health and biotech perspective. And then that's going to forever change how medicine's practiced, hopefully in a lot of good ways. And if there's people out there struggling, I want you to know that there's a lot more that's possible for you to dive into in terms of things that you can do at home than maybe you realized. Hi, I'm Dr. Matt Cook, and this is the Lifestylist Podcast. What's happening, beautiful people? Luke Story coming at you with episode 379, the latest cutting-edge treatments for Lyme, mold, and autoimmune with Dr. Matt Cook. This episode was recorded on a recent trip to Dr. Matt Cook's clinic, BioReset Medical in San Jose, California. During the week in which this recording was produced, I spent a lot of time in Dr. Matt's clinic as he worked brilliantly on some persistent back and hip pain issues I'm in the process of fixing. So this conversation was recorded at Dr. Matt's house in between treatments. Now, while we focused on pain and biomechanical healing during my treatment with Matt, which by the way, we cover in depth on this Friday's show with Dr. John Lawrence, in this episode, I wanted to focus on Matt's other areas of expertise, specifically Lyme disease and mold exposure recovery. Matt is one of the leading practitioners in the world, helping people to fully recover from both using the most cutting edge treatments currently available. Matt is a true renegade and is so incredibly knowledgeable about these conditions and how to treat them successfully. Matt uses an incredibly wide range of modalities to help people overcome these very challenging and unfortunately prevalent illnesses. And we go into great detail about why he's able to achieve such incredible results. So if you or someone you know is dealing with Lyme or mold, this is the episode for you. And make sure to share it far and wide so we can provide a ray of hope for people who are still struggling to overcome these issues. So right now I'm going to invite you to grab a pen and paper, sit back and prepare to have your mind blown and your heart opened by the incomparable Dr. Matt Cook. And again, stay tuned for this Friday show where we explore all of the innovative ways Matt and Dr. John Laurence are helping people like me overcome chronic pain and injuries. Enjoy the ride. So Matt, man, what an incredible few days we've had here. Yeah, it was, a, it was like a great pleasure for me, totally unexpected. And I was telling you right before we got on, you're one of the most thoughtful people I've ever talked to. So I really enjoyed having you here. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks for your hospitality here in the home. Um, it's not common that I go visit someone to interview them and get treated by them in such an incredible way. And then like, hey, come over to the house and stay. So it's been really fun to get to yeah. know you. Yeah, That's thanks cool. for that. Uh, I feel like we've had so many conversations that have been so deep and profound that it's like, God, what else is there to talk about? But we haven't talked about some of your um, areas of expertise when it comes to helping people get over chronic conditions that so many people are just stuck with. So as we get into a couple specific topics, perhaps you could just give an overview on BioReset Medical and what your philosophy is there and some of the types of treatments that you're doing there. Oh, thanks. So... Uh, BioReset Medical is, I would say, a uh, functional medicine practice, and so we do functional and integrative medicine. Um, I, I trained at the University of Washington and at UCSF, um, and so I, have a, I come from a fairly straightforward Western medical background, and I'm always sort of like trying to reconnect to that and reconnect to s sort of a traditional scientific perspective on medicine, and then integrating that with we studied Chinese medicine, we studied yoga, and um, sort of everything that has emerged in functional medicine, particularly with respect to taking care of complex illnesses. We do a lot of pain management. And so because of that, I do hydrodissection and ultrasound guided injections, essentially into every nerve and every joint uh, in the body. And um, which I find super interesting because we do that, I end up dealing with a lot of people with PTSD and trauma. So we take care of those issues. Yeah. And then the areas 
that I think are high reward in terms of functional medicine, in terms of optimizing health, is in complex illness and some of the big problems of our day. And uh, a lot of them have at their core some form of immune dysregulation that has a variety of manifestations. But I think, and we can kind of dig into it, a lot of, a lot of those problems uh, are fairly similar. And there are many similar triggers, often infectious, that lead to that. And so, um, and so that's, that's kind of a little bit of an introduction to who we are and what we do. And, and we take those approaches, the same approaches that we take for taking care of real complex problems, we apply for wellness and, and optimization. Right. So, and for those listening, uh, I have a sense this interview will probably come out before the one we did the other day with Dr. John Laurence here. Oh. Uh, but I want to let people know that we, we do delve deeply into uh, physiological issues and all of the injections, which is what we did on my back and hip. And we've been doing a lot of stuff here at the house too, to kind of continue uh, facilitating that <clears throat> healing. So for those that uh, are going to hear this interview, there will be one coming that goes really more specifically focused into that because mm -hmm. yeah, that's what we did together. And I think something that um, you're doing in an incredibly innovative way, I'm, I'm going to call you the wizard of <laughs> hydrosection <laughs> and injections now because just watching you and the steadiness of hand as you use those needles and I'm sitting there looking at the ultrasound and you're going in between these fascial planes with like incredible precision. It was really fascinating. So I want to make sure people also hear that side of your expertise. Uh, let's go ahead and jump right in with the first topic being mold recovery. You know, I did a show recently with Michael Rubino where we talked about how to identify mold in your house, the common sources, what to do about it, remediation and all of that. But because he's not a doctor, uh, we didn't really get into how to heal from it. So perhaps that would be a good starting point that would be really useful for a lot of people as public awareness continues to grow around this issue. Yeah, yeah mold and mycotoxin illness is, I, I remember... I remember first hearing about it like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and it um, it has just become a bigger and bigger problem, and we hear more and more about it and see more people with it. And uh, and in, what happens is, is typically there's somebody has a water damage building that they're exposed to. It could be at work, it could be some place that they temporarily stay at or commonly is in, in someone's house. And uh, if mold gets into the sheetrock, often there's bacteria in there. And so there's sort of a, a constellation of different microbes that secrete sort of a plume of toxins that uh, get into the air and then people breathe that in. And so then when that happens, then sometimes people will have a biofilm in the nose or they'll have a biofilm in the gut and they'll start to breathe in some of these toxins and those toxins will start to live and then uh, basically take up, uh, start renting space in your biofilm <laughs> and living inside you. And so if there's mold living in you, then what happens is mold will start to secrete um, these mycotoxins into your bloodstream. And so then what we do is we see people and try to get a sense of the story. We find out what they've done in terms of testing, try to build a model of, of what's happening with that. And then we do some testing. So I, I actually will test. Uh, there's a test called Markons to see if you have a biofilm in your sinus. And so it's a nasal swab that's kind of similar to a COVID test. We'll do a urine test and we'll see if there are urinary mycotoxins. And there's a couple different companies that we use. Uh, uh, one of them is called Real Time and one of them is called Great Plains. And um, uh, Vibrant America is another one that is, is coming out with testing. And, and we, we're using all three. The, um, uh, we also will do an antibody test to see if your body is making antibodies to mycotoxins. And just like we do a test to see if you are making antibodies to COVID, to see if A, maybe the vaccine worked, or B, maybe you got exposed to COVID, and we want to find out if you, was that actually COVID or not, we could do an antibody test and see if, if your body's making antibodies to it, then we know you must have been exposed to COVID. In the same way, 
we can do an antibody test and then we can uh, determine if you're making antibodies to mold and then how at what level those are and so there's a a, a few different companies out there um uh, but I like one called MyMyco, and Andrew Campbell is a very thoughtful uh, mold expert uh, who's a friend of mine, and so I like him quite a bit. So then with mold, then we're trying to build that model, and then in then sort of in parallel to that, I try to get a sense of, is this really an isolated sort of mild situation, or is there a bunch more going on? Um, Mold is one of those things that's a trigger that can start to, to irritate your immune system and cause immune dysregulation. And so the things that mold tends to travel with is, is chronic GI problems, chronic Lyme, and then chronic viral problems. And so then we try to talk to people and get a sense of, do we think any of those things are going on? If somebody's had a tick-borne illness or if they've really had a profound problem for a long time, then we start to do some of our Lyme workup. We almost always do a gastrointestinal workup with some stool testing and uh, try to build a total model of what's going on. And then based upon that, then start to in engage in strategies and treatments around what around uh, remediating uh, both in the house and then also within the body. Yeah, it's really interesting with mold. Uh, when I did that interview with Michael Rubino, he's the author of a book called The Mold Medic, and he has a re test uh, remediation company. I, don't, I think they outsource the test. But one thing that was really interesting uh, that I learned was that I think it was within 24 hours, if you see you know, water damage in your house, whether or not you see mold that's a color like you would typically see black mold or green or whatever it is, that you you already have mold <laughs> there, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like how important it is to catch water damage. And oh. thinking about, um, you know, all of those of us that uh, travel a lot, right? And you stay in just random hotels. Mm -hmm. uh, I always think that the mold is much more probable in an older building, say like an older hotel. And um, he was also explaining that oftentimes the mold is present from new construction because they leave the plywood outside and it gets rained on and then it's growing mold within 24, 48 hours. And then they just build a whole, you know, seven story hotel out of moldy stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's not even like you had to have a water leak. It's, it's really uh, complex and widespread issues. Um, what... Uh, would be some of the most common symptoms. You know, if someone has acute exposure, what are they going to experience subjectively that might lead them to seek out someone like you to deal with it? So I don't think that I'm really getting calls from people right now yet that, like, let's say, got exposed to it. We're, 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 and that in this conversation, we're fine. We're getting people who've had fairly profound fatigue, headache, neurological problems, uh, long COVID. We're getting, we're getting people that have had a fairly substantial immune dysregulation that's been going on for some time. And, uh, and, and I, I think that a lot of times there may be something underlying, like could be Lyme, or it could be chronic viral, for example, but it was kind of under wraps. And so people may have had some symptoms, but they didn't think of themselves as really being sick or having that significant of a problem. And then they'll get exposed and that exposure will start to trigger immune stress. And then all of a sudden they'll get a constellation of symptoms that may be part from mold and then part from these other things. COVID's almost exactly the same thing. And often somebody was feeling like they were okay and they had a handful of things, but it was kind of under wraps and people were sort of managing their lifestyle a little bit to the extent to keep things so they didn't have too many symptoms. And then they get that trigger, that trigger could be COVID. And then all of a sudden the mold they can't quite handle it or it triggers Lyme. And so uh, fairly profound fatigue, sometimes headaches. People, if, if they have a biofilm on the nose, people will have a lot of sinus uh, congestion and symptoms. So we always try to ask about that. Um, and 
those would be common ones. What what is biofilm for for those that aren't familiar with that? Oh, uh, a biofilm is have uh, have you ever seen like at a pond that kind of sludge that you see at the edge of like the cattails where there's kind of a, a mucousy layer uh, that is secreted by bacteria and fungi and yeast and other uh, just microbes and it's a collagenous uh, gel and within that gel. Uh, one time I was on a podcast, I described it as a house party so for, for microbes. And so all amoebas and parasites and all kinds of different things can go in and live there. And, and it's kind of a protection because it's a gelatinous place. And then uh, sometimes people can have a bowel from the nose. Sometimes they can have a bowel from in their gut. And so interestingly, sometimes when we treat people, they will pass that. So you'll start to treat people with herbals and, and other strategies to start to heal the gut. And then they'll pass a gigantic amount of mucus. And a lot of times after that, people will start to get better. And so then also in the same way, that's why part of why we're testing and asking about sinus stuff, because uh, microbes tend to come out and can go anywhere in the body, but then they retreat to safe spots where they can kind of hide out and persist over time. And the sinuses and the gut are two of the classic places where they do that. Also, Got it. also the teeth. Got it. Not so much biofilm. Let's say someone knows that they've been exposed to mold because it was present in their house and they saw it and they're feeling sick and seeing relevant symptoms. And they are, for whatever reason, not in a position to come see someone like you. Is there any um, benefit to trying to kind of go at it alone? Is there, you know, a home protocol per se without going through all of the testing and seeing a specialist and getting treated in a clinical setting? Um, you know, are there herbal formulae or liposomal nutrients and binders and things like that that someone could have success with? Or is it? If it's acute exposure, is it kind of too big for someone to really successfully deal with? Okay, so then uh, this is, I've never thought about this before, but I, this is a kind of a good idea. If somebody's listening to this and uh, they want to do some of that testing, for example, if they wanted to do, uh, we could mail them a kit and then they could do the urinary mycotoxin testing. And then even if they didn't want to, um, use us to help help them work through that at least they would have that data and that information and so then they could follow that so oh, cool. if somebody wanted to do that you can just call us and we'll mail you the kit and when your results come in we'll uh, we'll do that we'll send them to you because often if somebody has an issue and their resources are tight we'll do some testing up front to try to get a handle on what things are go going on before we really engage in doing much. Ah, oh, okay. And so then that's that's a reasonable idea. On And so then sort of one of the cornerstones of treating mold, which is sort of interesting, is that uh, imagine you have a little bit of a biofilm in your nose and possibly, let's say, even in the gut. And let's say you're secreting mycotoxins into your intestines, and then they're working their way down through your stomach into your small intestine. These are so tiny and so well absorbed, and particularly if you've got a little leaky gut, what happens is, is we tend to reabsorb them into the bloodstream. And then uh, once they get into our bloodstream, we run our blood through our big filter, which is either the kidney or the liver. Some of it will come out in the kidney, which is why we can find it when we do a urine test. And then some of it will go through the liver. And when that happens, the liver is going to push it back into the gut, but sometimes it gets reabsorbed. Oh, my God. So, so they call that enterohepatic recirculation. And so then you go, oh, my God, what are we going to do about that? And so then this has been the idea of binders. And so there's as just about as many binders as there are functional medicine doctors <laughs> so um and not uh everyone is perfect for every person and people will have a little bit of different preferences um there's one called cholestyramine that's a classic one there are some binders like zeolite and different types of clays uh there are a whole bunch of different forms of charcoal that are binders and what happens is if you take that binder that binder is a relatively large molecule compared to a small 
toxin. And that large molecule is so large that it's too big to be absorbed across your gut. And so then if that large molecule binds onto that mold toxin, now that mold toxin is stuck to that large binding molecule. And then now because it's stuck there, that large molecule is just going to work its way through your intestine and then come out um, the other end. And so then because of that, it, we're catching toxins, pulling them all the way out. And then over time, by doing binding strategies, we have the opportunity to decrease the total body burden of the mycotoxin. Right, and prevent that recycling system because you're stopping it at, at one choke point, essentially. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then is there any um, efficacy to doing like a Chris Shade Quicksilver uh, push catch kind of thing where you're instigating your organs to dump toxins and then you're catching them with these binders in the, in the gut. So or is that even relevant for mold? Yeah. So that's, that's, that's sort of traditionally a, a mold uh, strategy. And, and the idea with that one is, is you're pushing, you, if the mold gets pushed into your, through your liver, if you take a bitter uh, then that bitter uh, will cause your liver and gallbladder to squeeze a little bit, and it'll push some digestive juices that may be concentrated in mycotoxins into the intestine. And then if you have a binder in there, then you're going to catch those toxins and pull them through. And it's been interesting for me because it's, it's, it's an evolution. Some people will respond great to that and love that. Some people respond better to cholestyramine. Some people really like the charcoals. Um, uh, some people really like zeolites. Uh, there, there are some products that have a mixture of a, of a variety of different ones. And so then what I, I, and I use all of them and I see what people can tolerate. And, and it's, it's been an evolving process for us to put people on strategies. And a lot of times we'll put them on uh, cholestyramine for a while and then we'll rotate out. And so we'll, and, and then what we'll do is we'll retest. And so then you can imagine if there was somebody who was at home, you, you know, hypothetically, we could do a test where you um, look to find out uh, what your levels are and then start to do some binding and then retest. And so then we're, we're doing stuff and uh, 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 checking to see how things go over time. And a lot of times well, uh, it'll get a lot better. Uh, modified citrus pectin is another pretty good binder that also uh, helps pull out a lot of organic toxins. Uh, and so then that can be an interesting one. And it, there's also an aspect of uh, what people can tolerate. But then as we start to work on healing the gut and things like that, then uh, over time, people seem to be able to tolerate more. And when you talk are, about someone tolerating a binder, what would be an adverse reaction? Sometimes it can be cramping. <laughs> the, uh, sometimes uh, some people some people can get a little bit of nausea. Sometimes um, cholestyramine can can make people feel uncomfortable and they won't tolerate it that well. But then we'll go to low doses and they can do better. Uh, okay. Well, folks, fall is just around the corner, so the days are going to be shorter, and we'll have less of a chance to get that sweet, natural sunlight that we all need. Now, thankfully, I don't have to sweat the winter months ahead because of my Juve Red Light Therapy System. As you might have figured out by now, I am a sun fanatic due to the fact that we've evolved to be outdoors 24-7. Now, while Juve obviously can't replace natural sunlight, it does deliver similar wavelengths of light, red and near-infrared to be specific, that have been clinically proven to be very beneficial to your health. But don't trust this hippie. Trust the science. Thousands of peer-reviewed research articles have demonstrated the benefits of red and near-infrared light for things like skin health, reduced pain and inflammation, and faster muscle recovery. For this reason, there are of course tons of red light products on the market now, but I dig Juve for the following reasons. First, they offer a wide selection of configurations from small handheld devices to large setups that can treat your entire body. Another feature I love with Juve's latest generation of products is something called Ambient Mode, which uses lower intensity red light designed to be used at night as a healthy alternative to bright blue light. You can just throw one of these things on and 
it'll eclipse all the blue light in your environment for the most part. Since we're all staring down the gloomy months ahead, I highly recommend investing in a Juve device. I really use mine every single day, especially in the morning during my breath work routine. That's kind of my jam. And for a limited time, Juve is offering all of my listeners, including you, an exclusive discount code on your first order. Go to juve.com slash Luke and apply my code Luke for your qualifying order. Again, that's J-O-O-V-V dot com slash Luke. Of course, some exclusions apply for this limited time offer. I always travel with the little charcoal packs and stuff. And anytime I feel a little funky with anything, I always just take a binder, you know, yeah. and my body seems to love it. That's why I was like, wait, how could this not feel good? You know, yeah. I mean, it's, I'll wake up with a clearer head. It's just, I don't know. It's, it's a great how, thing to do. That's how I feel me. overall. I think they're, they're pretty darn well tolerated. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, but then that's, that's something that consistency is going to pay off because it's the consistency of regular over time working on something that is going to that help you really detox the body. Right. And then what about someone tests, they go through one of these protocol and then they've say moved out of their house, but brought their sofa and all their clothes and blankets with them from the moldy house. Do you find that it's common that someone inadvertently kind of reinfects themselves from not going just completely ham and nuking their entire life and starting over? Yeah, so this this one is a tricky one. And, you know, I don't, I'm not sure that I have exactly the right answer on what to do because I think the right answer is individual to each person and sort of depends on the se- severity. But it does feel a little bit like nuking your entire life. Um, I It was hilarious to get my practice started which was as you can see is quite a bit (laughs) i uh sold my house and i moved into a two-bedroom apartment and then like just went all in turned out the two-bedroom apartment had a front-loading laundry uh that was um had mold in it (laughs) so you you can't make it up and so i actually let go of everything before i came here Wow, even what? even your old uh, collector's item dead shirts. <laughs> <laughs> I think they came. I'm just assuming you well, had those. You know, so you know what we did is I took <laughs> I found a, a dry cleaner that like did an, an anti mold thing, so I brought my clothes. Oh, cool. But the what? It, so like, look at the the couch is leather couch, right? And so then I think generally that's going to be okay. Uh, sometimes blankets, beds beds are super sort of toxic and so i think that there's probably a way to pick and choose what you bring and uh potentially nuke part of your life but not necessarily nuke your whole life and then also if you're if you're going through some good treatment a lot of times you start to get better right away and so you don't have to necessarily throw everything away and it's and often i find it kind of overwhelming for people because they come in and they just found out that there's a contractor that said you have to do a $500,000 remodel on a house that probably that's not going to add $500,000 of value to the house. So it's, it's a, it's, and with the flooding and the amount of climate change and problems that are happening in the world, this is just going to be an escalating problem that we're going to face. Um, there are a bunch of other sort of, ideas and strategies in terms of taking care of mold you know we do plasmapheresis which is another way of pulling out uh toxins uh this time instead of pulling toxins out of the gut we're actually pulling toxins out of the plasma and the blood that's floating around so we pull part of the plasma off which is a way to detox the body and this Um, is what you were doing when we showed up at the office the other day we walk in and matt's got i think like a a needle in each arm, and then there's these uh, narrow, uh, thin vials of blood that are then being ozonated, going back in one or coming out of one arm, back in the other, and then on the on the ground, there's a clear little bucket with this yellow <laughs> pussy stuff that is gradually filling up, which was the plasma that had been removed. Yeah, right? 
So everything that we do for other people, we do for ourselves. Yeah, and I, know, then, I noticed that you guys are like <laughs> self-administering all kinds of stuff ongoing. Yeah, yeah, it's and that's and so then it's been an amazing journey of kind of like constantly learning on ourselves, and it was it was awesome because uh, we normally are fairly busy, and then that day I I kind of booked the day out, and then you guys were late, and I thought. This is the greatest thing of all time because I was going to do flaps and phoresis. Uh, and so then I said, oh, I'll do a treatment. And it totally worked out perfect. Is the plasma phoresis something you would do in the case of mold if you had exhausted all other options? Or is that, if someone's able to do that, is that just part of a standard protocol for someone who has a pretty acute case of mold exposure? The, um, I would say that's something that we will do as, uh, as, uh, and for somebody who has a fairly severe case, we all, it's something we also do for wellness. And it's a strategy that detoxes the body and, and we think that it has the potential to, the when the body looks at itself afterwards and realizes, oh, look, we've detoxed a lot, it kind of gives the sense to the body, economic indicators are good, everything's okay, and we can reboot and get going. And so there was these, there was an animal model that studied uh, 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 plasmapheresis uh, called neutral blood exchange. And in that animal model, they took animals, uh, did a plasmapheresis, and then they did a, uh, a study of their brains afterwards. And the plasmapheresis induced hippocampal neurogenesis, which is, is that it started to turn the uh, the neurons in the part of the brain that controls memory back on and so then this is part of the, damn i need to do that <laughs> yeah i know yeah, you will <laughs> wow that's really that's interesting yeah with the plasmapheresis i'm glad you brought that up because i forgot the name of it and i wanted to touch on that um ha have you seen any really impressive before and after results with uh, things like heavy metals and and other general toxins is it <laughs> you know, on par with chelation or some of the other ways people are typically dealing with getting toxins uh, out of the body? So there's, there's sort of two, there's two traditional ways that plasma phoresis has been done. The, uh, the traditional way to do plasma phoresis has been for really severe autoimmune cases. And the reason for that is, is that if you imagine your blood is about 50% uh, cells, red blood cells and white blood cells, and 50% plasma. If your body met an infection, your cells would go, man, there's an infection. We better make some antibodies to it. And so the antibodies would be made, and those antibodies are floating around in the plasma. So there's cytokines and inflammatory mediators and antibodies and all kinds of stuff that are part of the immune response that are floating around in that plasma. So the traditional way of doing plasmapheresis involved putting a really gigantic needle uh, in in one and really in both sides, and then but for sure on on one side, and then pulling off almost all the plasma. And so then the model that was done with that is is that that was done six times. And so then the idea with that is is that they're pulling out all the plasma. Each time you do it, you have to replace some of the proteins that are in the plasma called albumin. So that happens. And um, this was a full-on, super intense uh, detox strategy where we were doing that for, for major cases of uh, autoimmune disease. We actually did that for Barb when she went into uh, kidney rejection several years ago. Then uh, we figured out a way to do plasma phoresis where we would do lower amounts, but I can do it with smaller IVs, which is much easier because I can just put a 20 gauge IV in, which is a very straightforward and easy thing for me to do and for patients to go through. And I do that on both sides. And what I've evolved into is pulling off about a liter and so I'm not pulling off that really profound, huge amount, but I'm pulling off enough that I can get a fairly substantial detox. And it's not that overwhelming. 
almost everybody feels totally great or like we treated somebody the other day and and he felt a little off the next day and he called today and he was like i feel great so um uh and so we're it it has taken me the last three years of almost constant work of trying and and getting the strategy and and we do the the super big one and then we also do the smaller one and i've basically totally wired it so that it's super smooth and easy and so now we're starting and and i my protocol is really set on that and so now what we're doing is we're just starting to do our tests on that people are telling me they feel a lot better and um and so then over the next six months i'm going to have a lot of data on this but mold patients seem to do really well and feel much better when we go through it and my early indication is this that that numbers are coming down faster than i would expect just with binding wow cool uh if if that method of detox works because it's it's getting out all of that plasma that contains these toxins if that was the point of doing it solely, would you also do another protocol that's mobilizing the toxins in the fat to get that out? So, so then that's a good one. The, the idea is, is that if you mobilize something from the fat, then it's going to go into the bloodstream. From the bloodstream, you got to do something with it or it could go back into fat. And so then, sort of philosophically, at 1.0, you've got things like binding. That's just taking it in the gut and pulling it out. And to the extent that you're doing that, you're slowly lowering the tank, the the total burden in the whole body. Uh, doing things that are detoxing plasma is another thing that's detoxing the total level on the body. And as we do that, there's that's going to accelerate the gradient between fat and plasma. So I think that what's going to happen with that is that's going to drive a flow of toxins from the fat into the plasma. Oh, because there's you sort of created room for it. We're, we're, right? Yeah, we're working kind of a down in osmosis gradient. And then how does the um, ozone play into the way that you're doing it? So ozone is super interesting. Uh, I'm doing an extremely small, almost homeopathic amount of ozone when I do the plasmapheresis. So um, what I think happens is, is you get some immune regulation with the ozone. Uh, it's also anti-infection, but I'm giving a very small amount. And um, I th oh, and and interestingly, what's happening with mold but what's happening with lyme what's happening with all of these conditions is that there's immune dysregulation and often there's something that has an infectious aspect to it that is stressing the immune system and so if you can detox somebody but you can give them a little bit of ozone with that that has a um uh that's helpful in terms of the body's overall ability to deal with things. And ozone has uh, probably some mitochondrial benefits as well. Um, but it, interestingly, as, as I've kind of evolved into it, I've, I've I found that people do well with really, really low amounts. So if you're an ozone person, I'm talking about five gamma. So, oh, wow. So super, super low amounts. Oh, that is low. Um, and it's interesting though because you could still see the con when you were hooked up you could still see a very clear contrast in the color of your blood yeah, from one yeah. arm to the other because because um when i'm doing that i'm uh running uh ozone through the blood but i'm running a very very small amount uh but i'm also running oxygen oh and okay <clears throat> interestingly i'm probably going to start to do some cases where because from a regulatory perspective uh, ozone super off label and uh i'm my sort of next step is to start doing this just with oxygen uh, oxygen and you'll probably get as much oxygen uh you'll get some, probably more oxygen than you would in a hyperbaric oxygen treatment wow um at with no pressure uh because right. is it getting the oxygen into the plasma like a chamber would yeah, because basically I'm running the uh, blood uh, through uh, through a plasma separator, and uh, I'm and while that's happening, 
I'm running oxygen through uh, the system. Oh, okay. So then I'm oh, continuously cool. oxygenating the system. Wow, that's badass. You do so much cool stuff. So fascinating. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Water is the number one nutrient you need to stay alive, second only to oxygen. So I think it'd be wise to take water very seriously as it is the true foundation of your health. I mean, your blood, lymphatic system, reproductive fluids, mucus, tears, saliva, and virtually every liquid in your body are essentially made of water. If you're a man, I would ask yourself, do you want to conceive a child with sperm swimming in chemical-laden seminal fluid? If you're a woman, would you like your unborn child to begin its life swimming in amniotic fluid made of toxic water? Now, call me crazy, call me conspiracy theorist, or just being a little extreme, but to me, that is a less than ideal scenario. So for my water needs, the one place I go to is water and wellness. In fact, we use their AquaTrue purification system at home and also remineralize the water that we just purified with the Quinton Minerals. It's a pretty incredible strategy, actually. And Water and Wellness happens to be the only destination online where you can get the above-counter reverse osmosis filter, AquaTrue, bundled with Quinton Minerals for a deep discount. And right now, you can save even more at Water and Wellness when you subscribe to their SMS text alerts because you'll get early access to Black Friday promos and a $10 e-gift. So if you want to get your water and mineral game on point, I highly recommend that you get over to waterandwellness.com slash story to see all of those offers. And when you get over to waterandwellness.com slash story, don't forget to use the code STORY10 at checkout for an additional 10% off. That's waterandwellness.com slash story. Well, let's then talk about uh, Lyme, you know, which is just... I mean, I get so many people asking for um, uh, podcast <clears throat> episodes about that and so many questions and so much confusion and uh, having known about Lyme for a long time, because as we were uh, talking about earlier, we're pretty sure my mom's had it for ages. Mm -hmm. So I found out about it um, you know, 25 years ago or something like that. But at that time, I mean, it was very obscure and mm -hmm. most traditional um Western docs didn't even really acknowledge it or know what mm -hmm. to do about it. It was just super random, often thought to be psychosomatic and just super difficult for the people that had it. And now thanks to innovators like you and many others, it's no, it's a real thing. We're mm -hmm. realizing this is a real issue. So um, what's your, I guess, approach to helping people overcome Lyme? So that's a good one. This, this, I mean, it's such a needed and important uh, topic in general and then particularly now just with everything going on with COVID and the COVID long haul community um, so th there are Lyme as a, as a constellation of problems it could be defined as a tick-borne illness and so then there is this one bacteria called Borrelia or, and the um, it's a spiral shaped bacteria is a spirochete it tends to live inside cells so it can be a little bit hard to find wow yeah but it can also live in clusters and colonies outside cells and uh and it tends to be somewhat good at evading the um uh, immune system and and partly because if something's living in inside a cell uh, your white blood cells go look and they don't they can't see uh, the Borrelia because it's living inside your cell. Would Kinda, that be true of antibiotics as well? That's why the antibiotics that people are trying to use are trying to get antibiotics they can get inside the cell. Oh, okay. But um, so with uh, but then there's a whole bunch of other bacteria and parasites. Uh, and other problems that tend to be associated with Lyme that are, and, and in terms of tick-borne illnesses, there's a, a blood parasite that's kind of similar to malaria called Babesia. And so just like ma um, malaria, um, you, people get night sweats. Babesia is kind of famous for giving people night sweats. And um, then there's a, a, a bacteria called Bartonella. And uh, Bartonella is famous for causing headaches, 
causing depression, causing anxiety, causing a lot of psychiatric and neuropsych problems, uh, Borrelia also. And, and, and those are sort of the three most common, but then there's a whole host of other lesser known uh, bacteria uh, and they, they can be associated with uh, these tick-borne illnesses. And, and so then what we do is we do a uh, blood test where we do antibody and ELISA and Western blot and fish studies. There are a whole bunch of different laboratory scientific analysis. And what we try to do is we try to see, oh, oh, okay. So just like I could say, hey, I wonder, I heard you were sick. I wonder if you've got COVID antibodies. In the same way, I can go, oh, hey, I heard you got bit by a tick last year. I wonder if you're making antibodies to Borrelia or any of these other bacteria. And so then that's our part of our screening workup as we do that, that test. Now, what I'll tell you is, is there's a lot of people that may get bit by a tick and they may have positive antibodies, just like somebody that got exposed to some other infection and they got positive antibodies, but they don't have any problems. And there are other people that have kind of a catastrophic chronic fatigue, inflammatory immune illness, and they also have those antibodies. And so part of what we're doing is we're trying to take a, an inventory of this, the symptoms that they're having and how they're doing and, and what's happening with that. Uh, look at their, uh, their blood tests to see uh, what we find. There's also people can do some urine testing to see... Uh, if uh, any of the byproducts of those bacteria are coming out in the urine. And then, um, and then in terms of Lyme disease, then we take sort of a, a, a deep dive into trying to say, is anything else going on that's dysregulating the immune system that's contributing to the picture of what we're seeing? What are kind of the, the, the obvious one is mold and uh, when mold is like, like I was saying before, water damaged buildings and mold, but it's also bacteria and it's also, also other, uh, fungal organisms. So mold's a little bit of a, a bigger and more diverse problem than just the mold that we think about. And, and mold can be a big driver of activating Lyme disease. And so then sometimes I'll meet a, a couple and one person and first, because they want to do it, we'll do blood testing on both of them. And one person's kind of running the world and basically has no problems. And the other person is overwhelming illness. And they may have similar Lyme tests, but often the one with a lot of problems has a handful of other things going on. And the biggest thing other than, um, than mold that we try to pay attention to and think about is that uh, what is the health of the gastrointestinal system? So people that have leaky gut, chronic um, dysbiosis, any autoimmune illness of the intestines, uh, uh, and uh, parasitic infections, all of those things can cause inflammation in the gut and the, the immune system's embedded in the gut. And so then as a result of that workup, we sort of say, oh, okay, we've done a bunch of blood testing. We've looked from kind of a systems biology perspective at trying to say, okay, what are we facing? And then based upon that, we kind of get an overall sense of what's going on and then try to develop logical sort of thoughtful strategies about how to go about fixing all of those things. And it's almost kind of like, uh, you gotta be a good project manager. Yeah, I bet. Oh <laughs> and, my God. And work those, work all of that. Yeah, it's really a um, systems approach. Yeah. Uh, do you think Lyme is able to be transmitted sexually? Is there any evidence of that? So it's interesting, if you ask in the, if you ask people in the Lyme community, and if you ask a lot of Lyme doctors, they'll almost unequivocally say yes. Um, I have, I have had quite a few patients who 
you know, had a history of being fairly sexually active and never had a, a, a tick bite. Um, I've had uh, mothers come in with kids that were in the city and never had any exposure to the wilderness at all and were sick from day one and, and, and ended up when they were very young t- getting blood tests and finding out that they had Lyme disease. And so I think it probably is, can be transferred in utero from uh, mother to baby. I think it probably uh, can be transmitted sexually. And, um, and, and it probably, uh, the ILADS uh, uh, community, this uh, Lyme community for doctors and patients, uh, uh, will say that um, there are small nymphs, nymph ticks, that can uh, scratch people and infect people uh, to the extent that they uh, they can get inoculated uh, with the bacteria, but uh, the they don't get such an intense bite that they get that typical target lesion uh, that some people will see. What and, w- yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, what would you recommend for someone who <laughs> finds a tick on themselves and 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 digs it out? I mean, is there an automatic cause for alarm and testing and making sure that, that you didn't contract Lyme uh, or does it depend on where you live or what kind of tick? I know I've had a couple um, and I've immediately Googled, taken a picture and Googled it and tried to figure out if it was one that is, uh, could potentially carry Lyme. Is there kind of a in the field protocol that you might recommend for people? Yeah, that is a really Really good question. The one is take a picture, try to figure out what it is. Uh, number two, uh, you can send it in, and so we'll have a lot of people that will get that tick and they'll send it in. Um, the it, in the community of Lyme doctors, a lot of people will say even if that test is negative, it doesn't really mean anything because uh, you it may it may it may be there may be some questions with that testing in ter- in terms of accuracy and um so then typically uh, what we used to do is we used to say oh we'll give you doxycycline which is an antibiotic and so then they would give you doxycycline for a month and now there's um evolving protocols for that, where sometimes people will do a doxycycline and azithromycin. Uh, uh, a, a, a patient just called me today, and he got bit by a tick, and he had long-term Lyme disease. And, and uh, oh, yeah. he he called another Lyme doctor who's great, and uh, she put him on a protocol of four antibiotics. Um, when I have somebody who had Lyme disease, or, or who got bit by a tick, um, I, I've come up with a couple interesting things. One is is that I have them come in right away, and I do subcutaneous ozone in the area of the tick, the tick bite, and it turns out that will calm down swelling, calm down pain. Would that just be like ozone gas? It's in a syringe? actually in, you have ozone gas in a syringe. Okay, and the concentration I use is like ten gamma. So it doesn't burn that much. If somebody was real sensitive, I might use a little bit less. If if it was you and you're tougher than the average bear, I might even use 15 or 20 gamma. Uh, it'd burn a little bit, but it would be helpful. Okay. Um, uh, then I will, um, for anybody that got bit by a tick, I'll have them come and do an ozone IV uh, once a week for the month. And so I'm doing something anti-infectious. And then when I do that, I'll often give them some other immune IVs. And so I'll give them vitamin C and glutathione. Um, if they don't want to do ozone, sometimes I'll just have them come do vitamin C IV once a, once a week for the month. Um, and uh, then uh, depending on where they are and if, if it's available to them, then uh, we will uh, often put them on a peptide protocol for, uh, for the month. And so traditionally, we had used thymosin alpha-1 and thymosin beta-4, which are great immune peptides. The, at the, from a regulatory perspective, those may be going away in, in the United States, but um, there's probably going to be some uh, new peptides coming out of the market that may replace them, at least temporarily. But those can be quite helpful. And then interestingly, I found that uh, for people with insect bites, if you inject peptides close to the insect bite, it's actually, from a first aid perspective, it's unbelievably helpful. And so then, like, Barb's, like, getting bit by, like, spiders and stuff, and it'll be, like, 
a total chaos. And then, and, and, and she's immunocompromised. And so then I would, and interestingly, BPC-157, uh, which is a, a peptide, is very helpful for insect bites and some of the swelling and pain. And so I, uh, I would inject maybe a milligram of BPC-157 kind of n- not into the, the where the bite is, but maybe an, an, an inch or two inches away, depending on the amount of swelling. And then uh, as, as an aside, if somebody burns themselves cooking, <laughs> like maybe a friend of mine, <laughs> then I'll do that. And then uh, she always calls that another B- BPC miracle. And so then BPC is quite helpful for little skin inflammation, infections, and burns and stuff like that, but definitely for bug bites. Oh, that's good to know because uh, there are a lot of damn bugs in, uh, in Austin. In Austin. <laughs> oh, my God. I've been using a plant medicine called Kratom for many years. It's an all-natural herb related to the coffee plant that's been used in Thailand for centuries. Kratom is a trip because it energizes your mind and relaxes your body at the same time. There are very few alkaloids on the planet that provide that unique combo of benefits. So I'll use Kratom when I want to chill out and be social or ease body pain. The cool thing, however, about Kratom is that while it's relaxing, some strains can actually give you energy for a workout or, in my case, even podcasting. It just helps you feel good without feeling impaired. The tricky thing is, though, there are a lot of super shady liquor store and smoke shop Kratom products available, but I wouldn't trust most of them enough to put them into my body. There can be issues with mold and other toxins that make the Kratom market challenging to navigate. Not to mention, some of them are extracts which could provide some pretty serious side effects that aren't worth the risk. The brand of Kratom I use personally is called Super Speciosa, and it has only one ingredient, pure Kratom leaf. So Super Speciosa is a very legit Kratom brand and the one I've come to trust most for regular use. And it's worth noting that for beginners, I recommend their signature Super Speciosa strain. It's the most popular, best-selling strain they sell and a good one to start with. So if you want to try Kratom and get 20% off your entire order, go to GetSuperLeaf.com slash Luke and use the code Luke. That's GetSuperLeaf.com slash Luke. But I did, uh, Dr. John, uh, our, our, our bud that was here hanging with us, he told me about... Um, garlic extract this stuff called allison because he lives in florida and he is from hawaii so i figured if anyone knows about mosquitoes he said yeah you take two of those a day they won't bite you anymore i thought that sounds like a wives tale but i did not it worked Mm -hmm. i don't don't get bit anymore but when i do it's hellacious so i'm going to keep that in mind and keep my my bpc 157 on hand yeah Um, when it comes to tick-borne illnesses what's the probability of one getting uh, another one of those co-infections that's bacterial from a tick that's not Lyme, but still wrecks you. Like say, you know, this tick isn't carrying Lyme specifically, but it has some other bad things. Would you kind of just do a, a, a tick protocol regardless of whether or not it had Lyme? So, um, or are some of them innocent and harmless and just look so, weird? So I would, within a patient community, I would say that uh, regardless of whether someone has Borrelia or Bartonella or, or Babesia or, or Lichia or Anaplasma, if, if you have those, any of those infections and you have immune s- symptoms, then um, you could call that either Lyme disease or somewhere in the Lyme spectrum. Mm-hmm. And so then the, I, so, so, and from a, so a, a treatment perspective then sort of a there's the systems biology approach of saying oh, okay so we these are the infectious things we're dealing with um this is what the gut looks like this is what sort of immune stuff seems to be going on and then neurologically we like to pay attention one thing that's super fascinating is is that you will have some people who got bit by a tick 10 years ago and they were, they may have had some immune problems and they may have had some mold, but things were kind of copacetic. And then they get a traumatic brain injury. And then all of a sudden they start to have chronic headaches and that traumatic brain injury never recovers. If, and it might have only been a mild concussion compared to um, what 
normally they they would have been able to recover from that in a few weeks and then we'll see some of those people a year later and they're no better from from a mild insult and we think that that in in a situation like that the tick-borne illness was able to get into the brain and start to have neurological uh, consequences there and and then people are struggling to heal um we do we do um a, a lot to try to focus on gut healing in terms of uh, uh, improving the microbiome, detoxing what's going on, fighting any parasites or any infections and anything that we can really find there. And that's almost like a full court press, uh, a full-time job of just kind of working and managing that. Um, my friend Mark Hyman, uh, has a, a shake called the Acromancia shake, which is um, uh, has basically uh, it has a lot of polyphenols and it has cranberry and pomegranate, and th- those help develop uh, the uh, the this one bacteria called Acromancia, which really supports mucus and a, a really uh, healthy uh, biodiversity in, in the intestines, and um, and so a lot of times we'll do that. We'll, and we have a kind of a host of strategies for that. We'll do a lot of IV therapy and we'll do ozone, we'll do plasmapheresis, we'll do ozone dialysis. And that constellation of modalities can be quite helpful in, uh, from an anti infection perspective, decreasing the sort of the total body burden of infection and then also uh, being a fairly substantial detox uh, to the body. There are a there's a, a host of strategies that involve uh, s- supplements and then immune supplements and then herbal antimicrobials that uh, are designed. If somebody has Babesia, there's going to be different herbs that you take than if somebody has Bartonella, and and different symptoms too. Um, the one caveat I'll just tell you is is that sometimes someone may test and the, and when they first test they may have two bacteria show up and then after they start to treat and the body's starting to work better and starting to get into where those infections are sometimes an, another bacteria will show up in that testing so it's an evolving process in terms of figuring out uh what's going on and it's not always just one and done right um god it's so complex this one i see why there's so much confusion around it yeah, just the the diagnosis and the evolution of testing to become more accurate, and then you find Lyme isn't just one thing. You know, like do I have Lyme or not? It's just so multifaceted, right? Super challenging. Uh, although, sort of, and and then for for me, you know, you we were talking. We think that from a regulatory perspective, peptides are somewhat at risk in in America, but. Um, I, I was telling you, I said, if I could just have one thing and keep it, I would keep peptides. If, I mean, if you if you said of everything you have, I'm going to take plasmapheresis away, I'm going to take hydrodissection away, of all of the things, like peptides are almost that helpful if I only wow, had one God, tool. That's a strong statement. If that were to happen, if the powers that be say we don't like this anymore because it works too well or whatever, um, then it becomes ultimately like a medical tourism thing. Like many people now that want, um, you know, expanded stem cells will go to Mexico or Panama or wherever it is. It'll, it'll become a thing like that where you have to fly to the Virgin islands or something to, to undergo treatment with peptides. Yeah. And, and, and so interestingly, I have this kind of abundance positive attitude at this point and so you know there's going to be amazing therapies there's going to be amazing modalities and there are going to be places in the world where people can do those things yeah. and so then that's going to be kind of this neat evolution i think that the peptides can be profoundly helpful for the lyme population and for in for two sort of two two or three interesting sort of reasons one is is that you've got these immune peptides that regulate the immune system and they really seem to reboot how the body is able to deal with infections and we've we've really seen this in in patients with lyme disease um and 
when we combine peptides with all of the IVs and the detox strategies, that's been the most effective thing that I've ever found. Um, number two, there are peptides that seem to uh, increase and improve the way that your mitochondria function. And your mitochondria are the cells that give us energy. Now, what is one of the grab bag kind of diagnostic terms that we use to describe almost all complex illness with chronic fatigue syn syndrome. And so interestingly, when you start to um, use the mitochondrial peptides, a lot of times people would be like, oh, I feel okay. Like I have energy again. And, and a lot of times mental clarity will come back. And so, and I said, I said, you know, interestingly, for a friend of yours we were talking about and i said oh well i could do a i could do ten thousand dollars of workup and testing and coming to see me and all of this stuff and i consult and talk for a long time uh but i also could just start with something that would probably make her feel quite a bit better and give her a little bit of energy and see if i could get her to maybe just feel a little bit better and feel, and often that can incite people to start to have any, enough energy to start to participate in a plan. Right. I mean, that's a huge problem with people that have chronic and complicated illnesses is that even if they find a potentially viable solution or practitioner, they often are too sick to even get there and take the appointments and get involved in the you know, their side of the work in a healing protocol, right? To even just mentally have the capacity to keep track of what you're supposed to be taking on what day and how much. And, you know, it's like a management to a detox or supplementation protocol or something, you know, which injection, how do you measure the CCs? I mean, if you have um, crushing brain fog because you're ill with mold or Lyme or something like that, then you would have to have like an in-home nurse to, to help you do it all, right? It's like, I think that's a that's actually a really great point is to get someone up to at least a base level of energy and mental clarity so that they have the motivation to keep going and and are going to see wow something's changing and then uh, perhaps overcome that sense of frustration and hopelessness that so many people have that have been ill for so long. I I it was so like I literally loved having you here like it was mm. super chill but interestingly <laughs> Likewise. And inter interestingly, like you see how we live is kind of like like to literally 24 hour a day biohacking, you know. It's like we're doing yoga and doing stuff that's good for you and it's literally our lifestyle that we're doing it almost constantly, but it's a lifestyle that has become super chill and like super low stress. And so if I could, and so then I, and so I loved when you said, I was like, I, and it was kind of funny because I didn't know who you were. And so I was like, oh, the lifestylist. I go, ah, I like that. That's because that's what we do. You know, it's yeah, so interesting. Yeah. yeah, it was no accident that, that I called this thing that because it really is a kind of an incremental adoption of modalities practices attitudes mindset the mm -hmm. whole thing that you kind of start piecing together and then that just becomes the way you live it's just normal and to someone who's on the outside of that and just living life like the majority of people are not that there's anything wrong with that but let's say they haven't been challenged by something that has necessitated them to go full on it seems like a lot of work mm -hmm. but when you're the person living that way it's just it's like is it work for, i always use this example if someone says, God, how do you do all this stuff every day? Like my jet lag protocol to an outsider looks totally insane and just like the most work and a huge pain in the ass. And I say, well, how difficult is it for you to get up and take a shower and brush your teeth every morning? Like, do you even think about it? No. Well, it's the same for me. I, you know, get up, take a shower, brush my teeth, walk to the fridge, grab a needle, stick it in my belly, move on, make a cup of coffee. It's like these little things that seem like a lot of work just become integrated into the way you live if you're someone who's interested in you know feeling well uh, to a really uh, high level and, and hopefully avoiding any of these chronic illnesses down the road um, that we're talking about now and and i you know we had a good conversation about sort of addiction and you, you 
We could have recorded 20 podcasts over the course of this weekend. Every time we're chatting, I'm like, should I just get my mic? Because I feel like this is another whole hour long, beautiful deep dive. But yeah, we, we were chatting a lot about addiction. Addiction. And, but, and, but you said, you were like, oh, okay, well, you, this is just all the stuff you got to do. Like you got to do sauna. Yeah, and so you, we went through all of the kind of the relatively low hanging fruit of lifestyle things that you can incorporate into your life that help you detox and give energy and kind of get you oriented towards a healthy strategy. Food is like another one. And if I could take sort of the entire complex illness conversation and and like I, I almost would like to get together with like two or three other smart, thoughtful people and just do a round table for an hour and, and, and do that three or four times of like, this is all the stuff to incorporate into your lifestyle. Because once your lifestyle becomes th- a therapeutic lifestyle, that's like as important as like everything else we're talking about in terms of just kind of getting things going. And I, a lot of times I almost feel like I'm like a, a detective and I'm like walking around and I like walk into a room and I, I, I see, I just see whatever people are eating and, and it's kind of like crazy. And so then I, I'll use that, I'll start teasing him and stuff and joking around. But then often it's, we get rid of that sugar and then we get rid of, you know, a few things. And I start talking about eating only meat that's organic. And so there's a lot of simple choices that you can make that I think create more balance within the body. And if you think about Lyme disease, what happens is I think that it's the spectrum. And so there's this, there's the person who's maybe the healthiest person in the world. They got bit by a tick. They mounted an immune response. They've got antibodies to, let's say, Borrelia and Bartonella because that tick had those bacteria and it was injected into them and they created an immune response and now it's gone. And then they got COVID and they got an immune response to COVID and it is gone. And they're, they've never felt better and everything's going perfect for them. So then that's one end of the spectrum. And there's another person who's way over here on the spectrum and they can't get out of bed and they've got brain fog and they've got Every, every and you know and then the the big sort of topics in the room lately uh, that uh, people are becoming more and more aware about is uh, something called postural orthostatic hypotension and the um, the sort of the common term for that is POTS P O T S and what happens with that is is that people can be like just sitting here and all of a sudden their heart rate will go high and their blood pressure will go low. Or sometimes they'll just be sitting here, their blood pressure will be low. Or sometimes, and the most common presentation is they'll stand up and then all of a sudden their autonomic nervous system is a little dysregulated. And so they can't raise their blood pressure when that happens. And so they'll pass out. Wow. And I used to say, I used to say that I had maybe a hundred cases of POTS that I had seen, and I had never seen one that was not Lyme disease. Okay. Now, turns out right, left, and center, all kinds of people that have long COVID also have this thing, POTS. And uh, so then that is a super interesting and complex manifestation of Lyme disease that's sort of worth paying attention to. Um, there are many people for whom if they do NAD, the NAD will start to heal the endothelial cells that line the blood vessels and their pod symptoms will get better. Uh, there's would, a, that, would you think that would be true of like uh, Dr. John's NAD suppositories, or is that only going to have that effect when you're doing it intravenously? Uh, I, well, I think the, the suppository is going to be slowly being absorbed, mm-hmm. and then that's going to have this nice low level effect that's going to be going on for hours. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably a good idea 
uh, because it's low level and it's it's starting to uh, uh, have a physiological effect that is not too intense and then nice and steady over time. Mm -hmm. um, mitochondrial peptides seem to be quite helpful for 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 POTS, and then also. Uh, as you look at the constellation of symptoms that people have, a lot of times as they start to get better, their, their autoimmune dysregulation will start to get better as well. Um, but so that's a real important one. And, and when it happens to you, when you stand up and all of a sudden you get lightheaded and feel like you're going to pass out, it's pretty crazy. And I've had people who had really profound manifestations of it. It was the initial thing that they presented with. And we, we ended up having to go through the whole workup and we, we figure it out. Another thing that um, a lot of people with Lyme uh, have to deal with is something called mast cell activation syndrome or MCAS. And what happens is, is there's these immune cells that are floating around in your body uh, called mast cells. And uh, if there is a, a triggering event, they can uh, release histamine and uh, they uh, uh, can, can facilitate kind of an uh, immune response that's a little reminiscent of like an allergy type of symptom. And so then uh, when that happens, sometimes it can happen to the brain and people can cause, have headaches. It can happen in the lungs and they can have breathing problems. It can happen in the gut and they can have a wide variety of different gut manifestations. Would that, would that histamine response ever manifest as, um, skin problems like yeah. rashes and yeah. things like that? Yeah. And so then the, and now who, guess who also gets, um, MCAS? Who? Long COVID. Oh, interesting. And so now, so now you've got, uh, and and interestingly, almost every time you find somebody that had COVID, they've got they're in the long haul category, and they, sure enough, you're starting to talk to them, and and interestingly, you find out, oh yeah, they've got some pot symptoms, and if I talk to them, I often will find not what I would call classic definitive by the books POTS, but some POTS symptoms. And then often they'll have some mast cell symptoms. And so then, and, and, and so then you begin to see that this whole conversation we're having is like the same conversation. All of these things are leading to the same road of immune dysregulation. And interestingly, uh, we found peptides to be fairly helpful for the diversity of these problems. Uh, we've found uh, being a good lifestylist is, is good for a diversity of these problems. And all of these problems, to me, are fundamentally sort of on a spectrum. And so then, as we start to get people healthier, they shift back towards that optimal, optimal status. And the it's been interesting it's been fascinating of the long covid people are some of the people who respond the quickest and i think it's because and it's it's sad lyme disease i had no idea what was going on with lyme disease in any way shape or form 10 years ago like you know i was an anesthesiologist and and people would come and say they had Lyme disease, and it was like as an anesthesiologist, we just didn't understand that, and so it took me ten years to kind of figure it out. Interesting, it was kind of crazy. Um, I mean, I can see why it's just it's not cut and dried, right? It's not just something that's easy to diagnose, and it's one thing. It's, and and they're having fundamentally so complex potentially, yeah. right? Especially on on a spectrum, it's not even like you have it or don't have it. It's like if you do have it where on that spectrum do you fall and how many co-infections and other issues like you're describing are involved in that. It's yeah. crazy. Where, whereas, and so we had no model of thinking about it. And so we've been sort of cobbling together our, our thoughts about it. And in addition to everything that I said, there's a lot of antibiotic protocols that, that are ex exist as well. But we typically do all of this stuff first. Um, the interesting thing with COVID is 
we kind of already had a model for immune problems. And so we're already sort of used to this. And, and then when somebody has long COVID, a lot of the long COVID stuff that we're seeing is four or five months old. And so it's a lot easier to take care of a problem as, as substantial as that problem is, if it's only a few months old. And so we, I've had a lot of people who will come and do two or three plasmapheresis cases, maybe an ozone dialysis, some simple IVs, and they'll, they'll come for a day or two and then go home, come for a day or two and start them on peptides. And then all of a sudden they'll get a lot better. And what I feel like is happening is I'm shifting them on the curve back towards health. And fundamentally, I think that's the case, whether we're talking about Lyme or whether we're talking about that mold or whether we're talking about COVID or some constellation of all of those things. And so then our overall strategy is to kind of build that, build, build a uh, systems model, start to work and project manage that, and then wrap kind of a healthy lifestyle around that and, and empower people. And it's, it's actually kind of inspiring because I spend probably an 45 minutes a day talking to Barb about what she reads in the, the COVID. She's like, well, I just read this in, in my COVID Facebook, Facebook group. And so the, in her long haul, in the long haul communities. And so then I, I it's a, it's a endlessly sort of interesting conversation to hear what's happening and with and and it's new you know you're i'm learning i almost learn more about covid from the social media than than i do from academic journals in in terms of she's like okay people are having these symptoms this is either this is what they're saying so it's real it's real uh it's an amazing evolution in sort of not only the practice of medicine, but the education of, 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 of doctors. Well, I think that's what's really interesting about what you're doing is, and I think it just fundamentally your personality and your approach to things is very open-minded. I think that's something that many people are turned off by when they see a medical practitioner that, you know, in the, in kind of in the old guard model that's dismissive of any ideas that the patient might have, <laughs> uh, dismissive of anything kind of in the periphery that they don't need to know, right? Because mm-hmm. it's like you learn things a certain way. This is your practice. This is the way you do it. And it's much more um, kind of rigid and dogmatic. And I think from a patient perspective, it's so refreshing to come in and see someone like you. I mean, I you know, we were podcasting, doing other things. So I don't know what your normal intake would look like, but I mean... We sat there for an hour and talked about, you know, every minute detail of the origination of my symptoms in my back and hip and things like that. I mean, it's a very detailed and also two-way conversation, right? It's not like this hierarchical system of I'm the medical professional. I know all. You are the patient. Don't dare ask questions or make suggestions, recommendations, bring in other ways of thinking about it because these are the confines that we're working in and you either agree to that or not. So I think it's just fundamentally very cool the way you're doing things. And it's just maybe part of your personality too. You're just someone who's humble and open-minded. And I, I love that about you. And I think that's a great inspiration to people practicing medicine that we're as the patient uh, practitioner relationship evolves that we're, it's a partnership, right? Not a dictatorship. And yeah. you're, you're both having some trust and reliance on one another and in, in what's working. And there's that element of trust that's there, I think is where I'm assuming a lot of the patient compliance and willingness comes from because they're a participant in their own healing. It's not like you're doing it for them. You're kind of analyzing some data and symptoms and your history and knowledge and then going, let's try this, let's try that, let's try this, let's try that. I mean, it's a much more fun way to try to solve a problem together, right? Yeah, it it's actually like is cool. way more fun. And then interestingly, I'm like pitching. I'm 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 pitching kind of as hard as I possibly can, the, like a healthy lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And so then, but a life it's interesting if you're pitching a lifestyle, that's 
I'm not going to live the lifestyle. I actually am living the lifestyle. And so I'm pitching the lifestyle I'm living in the hopes that I can get somebody to buy into it. But then that's them. And it's kind of endlessly interesting, you know, to to go through managing how to think about this. I had this this family that I've just fallen head over heels kind of in love with, this uh, Orthodox Jewish family. And we had to manage whether I could give them heparin um, uh, because the heparin came from a pig. But then, so then we called the rabbi and we found out that it didn't go in the mouth and it was only going in the IV and it was only one part and 5,000. So we got the okay. Oh, interesting. So it's like, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it was so awesome. <laughs> well, I like that. I like that. Do you think what drives your work and in innovation is? Would the primary driver be like the sense of satisfaction when you help someone to overcome something that they've just been stuck on and everyone else has been stuck on and you crack the code and put the puzzle, you find the missing puzzle pieces and then you see, wow, this person is now whole. Is, is that the main driver or is it curiosity and the innovation? Like, what do you think it is about you that gives you that dedication to the craft? Well, you don't just kind of settle into what you know. Ah, this is the way I do it. I mean, you're constantly learning and innovating. Where does that drive we, come you from? Know, so, my Harry McElroy, I work super close, and you, you got to spend a bunch of time with him. Yeah, super so we, cool guy. This is like the greatest. And so we were like, I I think it might be lucky because for we were we were talking as an anesthesiologist, it's almost psychically impossible for us to deal with something that's not is broken. Like if there's a problem, we feel like we 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 fix that like instantaneously. If the heart rate is low, we fix it in like two or three seconds. If the, and so then I think that was a little bit of men, my mentality. And so then I started doing this stuff and it's sort of staggering in retrospect for me to think about how complex it was to basically try to go learn the clinical practice of medicine over the last 10 years. It was almost like, and I, I was like, I was going to maybe just quit and go do like an internal medicine residency. I was like, it was really, I was on the, the fence of trying to feel like I had enough knowledge to do something. And so then, and, and, and I think uh, interestingly, I think I had a, uh, deep down inside probably some insecurity that um i i wasn't going to be good enough and so then i <laughs> as a result of that just ended up with this obsessive effort of trying to solve the problems that i was faced with and my friend my friend said he said well my impression of you is that you will do almost anything to get someone better which is kind of has been my mindset, and I think it served me well because it, it and I, and and I think it was it's so staggeringly complex to kind of face this stuff because there there are problems that affect every system. I remember somebody told me, "Hey, go into anesthesia is going to be amazing because then once you learn it, you don't have to learn anything else. It's going to be easy. You'll know everything." And and. I am now literally in exactly the opposite. I feel like I don't know anything, but I'm trying to learn as much as I can to kind of build this kind of model. And so then being kind of continually humbled and then in the search. And so we've been on a tear of like going, it took, it took me four years to, to totally understand and get great at plasmapheresis. And so what happens is, is we go out and we get something. And then generally when we're out on the road, kind of figuring that out, we find a handful of other things that, that, uh, are helpful. And then that becomes the next thing. And, 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 and then my sort of my feeling for my direction for the next 10 or 15 years is to begin to, in a, in a better way, curate that and, and then push push this information out and I guess kind of a grateful dead model of just trying to share the information as much as possible. Trading tapes. We're trading tapes. <laughs> I've got, I've got 1977. 
1977 film or east <laughs> christmas eve show yeah. yeah it's like the new way to do plasma phoresis right yeah exactly <laughs> that you discovered yesterday because you hit a lever and someone went "Ooh, wow that feels good yeah, I know it's it's been amazing because it was like with we were working and working and working and then all of a sudden it's like oh yeah that really works that I feel amazing when I do that, and so then, um, and and it, it, each each incarnation is like that with peptides with with the advanced IV approaches with with movement and mm. and uh, so I'm just like I'm kind of I'm I'm. I'm more excited than I've ever been because I see now kind of the possibility of of having kind of a uh, awesome experience. So in your practice at BioReset, I mean, you have an incredible team. It's I think I mentioned in the other podcast we did with John. Um, it's just an incredible orchestration of organization and people being there where they're supposed to be, and just so many moving parts. And even the day that uh, we first came in. It, you were just kind of hanging out with us. It wasn't even a real day. And there was still just like this beehive of just such accurate organization and precision. It was incredible. And I remember thinking, and you told us, yeah, normally in a day, what we just did with you, I would have done seven times or something. I'm like, it's just staggering to imagine that. But since, you know, your team is learning this from being around you and assisting you and things like that, but there's still only one Dr. Matt Cook, right? So what do you see in terms of logging the innovations that you're making and discovering what what's working and being able to then teach that or create a model around that that can be scaled so people that can't get to see you and do some of these really unique treatments can still have access to that healing? Where, where do you see kind of the future of your practice going in the way of um, scaling and being able to reach more people? Oh, so so we uh, have started something called Bio Reset University, and so you can there you go uh, go right <laughs> go right on over there, and then I'm literally just gonna give this all away, and so then uh, we're gonna teach how to do the IV techniques and talk about it and take cases and take people through cases, what's happening before, what's happening after. Here's their labs. And then talk you through that. We're doing that with peptides. We're doing that with ultrasound guided injections. And so then, I'm super excited about that because I'm going to take probably a day and a half, and maybe even two days a week of just doing that. And I think that's going to start to scale and get people more used to the idea of doing ultrasound guided procedures. And and interestingly, what took me four years to learn in plasma phoresis, I'm fairly certain I can teach to somebody in a couple months. What took me basically 16 years, it may, maybe 19 years, what took me 19 years in terms of ultrasound guided injection, I think I could do it in three or four. Um, and I think if somebody was really dedicated and wanted to do it, that they could do it. And it's just going to take time and effort, but by pushing things online, and it's kind of a COVID blessing because before nobody really wanted to be online, but now I think <laughs> we're going to take this content and, and push that out. And I'm actually super hopeful that we're going to have a, a, a profound impact of getting people to kind of adopt new ways of thinking. And, and I think, interestingly... If you said, if you talked about mold or lime a year and a half ago, most of the people that we talked to were like, oh, I don't have that and that doesn't relate to me. And that, that seems kind of fringe. And so then people sort of almost discounted that whole thing. And interestingly, now we're evolving into the, this aspect that there's going to be millions and millions of people worldwide that have long COVID that tends to be associated with a lot of these immune problems. And so then what's going to happen is, is people are going to stand up and pay attention and, uh, and patients are standing up and people are, and, and we're going to have, uh, I think just like after world war II, there was this incredible surge of technology 
that came out of almost like a resurgence of the industrial revolution worldwide. I think that that's going to happen after COVID from a, a health and biotech perspective. And then that's going to forever change how medicine's practiced, hopefully in a lot of good ways. And if there's people out there struggling, I want you to know that there's a lot more that's possible for you to dive into in terms of things that you can do at home than maybe you realized. Cool. Thank you for that. Uh, there's two little micro questions I want to throw in before we wrap it up. Uh, when you were talking about getting bit by a tick and you could see perhaps a professional that could just inject ozone gas around that site, do you think there would be any benefit to applying an ozonate, like a quality ozonated oil on that oh, that's site? That would be a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's a okay. super easy, that's something you can buy online. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I think I have one or maybe even one or two brands in my web store of that. And I use it on bug bites, but as I was telling you, Allison hates the smell of it. So I oh, have the ozone olive oil. Yeah. She, I mean, she's cool with, she's super cool with everything about me and all of my brilliant weirdness. Um, but that is the one thing she's like, not in our house. It just drives her crazy, really? but it really works for bug bites. And yeah, stuff. It, you know, I, I use it fun. on mosquito bites and it's just like, they're yeah. done. Um, so I've had to find alternative ways without driving her crazy with that. So, so then there are a whole bunch of different ozone oil products. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's some with linseed, there's some with olive oil. And, uh, I, th I'm, I, and I think there's some with coconut and, and they don't all smell the same and some don't smell as intensely. I think the one I have is hemp. I think that's the one that she found to be hemp oil. I think okay. she found that one to be really, I mean, I, I admit it does smell disgusting, but it's not just the smell. It's just, it's so pervasive. I mean, you put a little on your yeah. arm and then you get in bed, the whole bed smells like it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and even if you wash the sheets, it's uh -huh. just like, I don't know, it really sticks. But anyway, I was curious about that. And then I think some people listening to the show, because I've talked about my love of ozone. I have a generator at home and uh, I use it. And, you know, I've done a few episodes about ozone specifically. And some people be familiar with uh, 10 pass ozone treatments. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and then you mentioned doing ozone dialysis. And earlier when we were hanging out this weekend, you said that over time you found that to be most more effective for for many of the things that you're doing. So what what's the difference between like a 10 pass ozone treatment versus <laughs> ozone dialysis so the 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 10 pass uh is a, a machine that uh one iv is put into the body and there's a vacuum that pulls blood up into a um a chamber and then uh the machine puts uh oxygen and ozone and injects it into a that chamber and it's mixed uh with the blood and then the blood goes back in so no gas goes into the body and if that happens one time it's a one pass and that if that happens 10 times it's a 10 pass i think it was a little bit of a marketing idea the idea of doing 10 pass and but it's also a dose so if you do it 10 times that's a relatively high dose of ozone um and uh, and it's a great modality and has been profoundly helpful for a lot of people with complex illness and and other other problems. Um, the the ozone dialysis t is an approach where an IV is put in one arm and then blood is pulled out of that arm. It's it goes through a pump and then it goes through a dialysis filter. And while it's going through the dialysis filter, an ozone is uh, infused through the dialysis filter as the blood is coming up. And then that uh, blood goes back into the body in the, on the other side. It's a substantially bigger procedure to go through compared to the 10 pass. For as, as people think about uh, problems, uh, with uh, and, and in terms of dealing with using ozone, I always like to say it's a really good idea to start low and go slow. And so often what I'll do is have people do an IV where they'll do one pass of ozone, and then I might give them a little bit of some antioxidants or some vitamin C or some uh, uh, other IVs, and then call it good. So I don't do too much. Uh, the oxidation of the blood um, creates an antioxidant response within the body. And 
Uh, it also has the opportunity to oxidize viruses or bacteria or yeast that may be present in the blood or in other parts of the body. And what happens is, is that ozone can form lipid peroxides uh, with lipids that are in the blood, and those can dissolve inside cells where they can have an effect for example, on an intracellular bacteria like Lyme, but also have a variety of other positive effects uh, in terms of uh, getting some oxidation within the cell that can, for example, help restore the NAD to NADH ratio and uh, have some mitochondrial benefits. When you, uh, uh, after people can do that, often I'll have them do two or three passes maybe six passes and then 10 passes. And so I kind of, in, in my best case scenario, I would evolve to going m more slowly. If I saw you and you had quite a bit of experience, I might let you do a 10 pass. But I almost never would start with that. I almost always start with two or three or four passes of ozone just to kind of get going and see how somebody does before I do ozone dialysis. When I do the ozone dialysis, usually I start with really low um, gamma. So often I'll start with five or ten gamma, and then evolve up. But it's it's very sort of person dependent in terms of how we do that. The ozone dialysis, because you're running it through a filter, it's a better detox. You pull out some toxins. The filter is going to catch some toxins. And so I find people have less side effects and they get a more profound and more sustained experience. Often people who came to see me and they were getting a 10 pass once a week, I start doing ozone dialysis and then they need to do ozone dialysis every couple months. So then I'll have a fairly sustained experience with that. And then usually what I'll do is I'll do ozone dialysis only maybe once or twice and then I'll move them to plasmapheresis. And I generally find quite a bit better experiences with plasmapheresis than I do with ozone dialysis. And interestingly, uh, I'm sort of evolving into this, but I'm evolving to less and less ozone and in, in because at, at lower levels. And I, I think that what I'm doing is I'm getting an oxidative response, but not too much. And it's in a balanced way and people are feeling super great. And in the back of my mind, I know if for some regulatory reason I lost it, then I can do plasmapheresis with oxygen. Right, right. So I think that's the interesting thing about regenerative medicine, right? Is you always have to be kind of three steps ahead of regulation and have a backup plan if you find something that really works and it's we know that it's safe and effective, <clears throat> yet for whatever reason the powers that be deem it not to be at some point, then then you're left without your toolbox, right? It's like you have a hammer and a screwdriver. <clears throat> You're always using the hammer because it kicks ass and someone says, you can't use a hammer anymore. Well, you better have you know a little stick or something that's going <laughs> to suffice to do the same job, right? Yeah, it's actually emotionally, I got into this headspace with that, which is now I feel super calm because, okay, well, you can take anything you want away from me and I'm kind of just going to have to evolve into finding a new way to, to do things. But as we evolve, I, I feel like, Regenerative medicine is doubling almost every year, every couple of years, and our ability to do it seems to be doubling. We're tw I, I almost feel like we're twice as good at everything as we were a year ago. And part of that is our lifestyle is we just do all of this stuff to ourselves, and, and we're personally way better than I've ever been. And then, uh, and, and then sort of watching and learning, we're kind of, we're, I'm, I'm on the journey with you because we're doing it together. And so I'm kind of endlessly excited to see what happens. Cool. Me too, man. Well, thank you so much for the work you're doing. Thank you so much for having me here for the past few days and the incredible treatment that we experienced together and just your dedication to doing what you're doing. It's so awesome. And I'm so forever grateful to meet you and just have the opportunity that I do continually to sit down and have conversations like this and share this information with people. I know that so many people are going to listen to this conversation and have aha moments that there is hope and there's a way to deal with some of this stuff, mm -hmm. despite the frustration and hopelessness that's often inherent to these types of issues. So thank you so much for that. And I'm going to let you off of our 
final question because you answered it in the episode with John. Nice. So you're you're good on that. Uh, but let's get any any websites. You mentioned your your school. Is there anything else you want to share with people? We can put in the show notes. Well, uh, come ch- come listen to our podcast at BioReset Podcast. Check us out at BioReset University, and uh, everything's at BioReset.com. And we'd love to see you and uh, participate with you and help you out. Awesome. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks. Well, that brings this enlightening conversation to a close. I want to thank you so much for joining me. It was an incredible experience to be able to spend some time not only recording this episode with Matt, but also in his clinic, which you're going to learn a lot more about on this Friday's special bonus show, The Future of Chronic Pain and Injury Healing, with not only Dr. Matt Cook, but also my friend, Dr. John Lawrence, who is present uh, during this trip as well. And uh, that really, really was a wild ride. I mean, I'm in Matt's clinic. He's injecting me with all sorts of different things uh, using something called ultrasound guided hydrosection. And uh, we're listening to the Grateful Dead. He's got all these needles in me. It's just an incredible experience. So I'd love for you to tune in this Friday and learn more about that. Uh, Both of those doctors are just incredibly innovative, brilliant, and super out of the box. But I've also got some incredibly exciting news. Now, I've been talking about this for a while, and uh, man, it's just been quite a project to get it launched, but I finally did it, and that is my blue-blocking eyewear brand called Gilded, which you can find at gildedbylukestory.com. That's G-I-L-D, gildedbylukestory.com. And uh, as someone who used to work in the fashion industry for an incredibly long time, I think it was around 17 years before I moved into the health and wellness space, which is where you're hearing me now, I've always been into fashion, but I'm also into correctly blocking blue light. There's a lot of just very ineffective blue blocking eyewear on the market now, specifically in the fashion space. So you can go on a big fashion brand's eyewear site and see blue blocking glasses, but they're clear and they don't really do what you need them to do. And I'm someone who's all about circadian rhythm, circadian biology. Those of you who have heard uh, people like Matt Maruka and Dr. Jack Cruz on the show will be tuned into this. But I think this is just a really important uh, thing for us to cover. We've not evolved to be looking at blue lit flickering computer screens and overhead lighting and uh, LED lighting from cars approaching us at night, et cetera. We've evolved to uh, live um, in firelight and maybe moonlight. I guess technically moonlight probably has some blue light, but you get where I'm going with this. So I took it upon myself to create some really cool glasses because a lot of the glasses on the market, uh, A, as I said, just don't block the correct spectrum of light. B, just look kind of corny. And as someone who's into fun fashion, I decided to combine the leading edge science with fashion. So you can find those at gildedbylukestory.com. I'm really excited to share that. Those dropped a couple days ago. You might have heard me talk about it on prior episodes, but they are there now. So you can go get men's and women's, and we will be expanding the product line in the near future. So I think we have six pairs on there now, three men's, three women's, which I love. And uh, if all goes well, we'll be adding more. So thank you for joining me on that journey, launching my first product. Super exciting stuff. I think I started it in the middle of the pandemic and you know, like so many people's projects, uh, it was quite delayed and took a while, but it's done. All right. So in addition to this Friday show with, again, Dr. Matt Cook and Dr. John Lawrence, where we cover pain and injury, we've got an incredible episode coming back next Tuesday. It's called Super Learning, Memory Gains, Remote Viewing, and Manifestation with Dr. Patrick Porter of BrainTap, an incredible guy. He's been around forever. I've seen him speak at tons of the conferences and seen him around, and we finally got a chance to drop in here in Austin, Texas, and sit down for an incredible episode recorded at really beautiful property called, uh, uh, what's it called? Music Hill Ranch. Yeah, it's right right around the corner from my house. And uh, I'll be doing probably more recording there. They, they're doing a lot of really neat things at that ranch, and uh, we happen to be doing an event with brain tap. So I was finally able to get Dr. Porter in person. So that's what's going on. We've got the gilded glasses. We've got this Friday show. We've got next Tuesday's episode, and I'm just going to keep cranking out the content. You know, there's so many fascinating people to talk to. 
I love sharing these conversations with you. And honestly, more than anything, I love just producing these conversations, participating in them. I learn so much all the time. Sometimes I'm surprised my brain can even hold the amount of information that I'm able to take in. And so I trust that uh, if you're a regular listener, you're benefiting from these episodes. And if you're new and you're hearing this outro, welcome to the show. The Lifestylist Podcast is all about taking different principles and truths from all teachings, whether they be metaphysical or physical, and putting them in one place so that we can integrate them into our lifestyle and really build the ultimate lifestyle, which uh, is what it's all about. It's you know manifesting and creating a life that you enjoy so that you can share that joy with other people. Because what good is it really to be healthy and happy if you're not making a contribution? However, it's difficult to make a contribution and live a life of service and love if you're really struggling with chronic illness, whether that be emotional, mental, or physical. Uh, and also if you're lacking a spiritual connection in your life, a sense of purpose and meaning. So that's my aim with this show as we move into the end of this insane year called 2021. Uh, I'm excited to drop these last episodes with you, and we're going to start 22 off with a bang. Uh, I've already recorded a few of those episodes, and it's just awesome. I mean, you know, there are some scary things going on in the world, but I am a firm believer, as I said, in creating our own reality. And so despite some of the challenges that we face collectively, as the human species, there are so many people doing great things in the world, and it is my great pleasure to share them with you. So thanks again for listening. We'll be back Friday and again on Tuesday. Mm-hmm.